morning at 8 a.m. So it's a pleasure to get the opportunity to talk again. And let me grab my mouse here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the use of uh, endovenous ablation and focus primarily on radiofrequency ablation. Uh, after hearing that excellent presentation, I can tell you that using radiofrequency is much simpler. It simply generates heat, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I have not had uh, experience with the laser, but I've had extensive experience with radiofrequency. I'm also going to mention a new uh, device that uh, does a mechanical chemical ablation. You may be familiar with it because it just come to the United States recently, but it's been used worldwide. And then lastly, we're going to talk about perforator ablation specifically. Uh, as Dr. Asher mentioned yesterday, uh, I think those in the United States who have gotten involved in doing a large venous practice, and for us this represents probably uh, several thousand patients a year, uh, have an excellent site for doing this. And we find that this is absolutely critical. You'll notice not only is a receptionist, it's a relatively modest area uh, where we do both angiography and venous procedures, but the key is that it has a tilt table, and so I think you can, you can appreciate, let me get my mouse here, this tilt table which is used for Trendelenburg and reverse Trendelenburg in all of our patients, and we control that ourselves with a foot pedal. So you can essentially do this with yourself and another single person uh, who helps you. We also have uh, ultrasound available in the room and uh, actually do that ourselves. So this is a single person procedure with an assistant who provides for the equipment. Now, uh, as you heard about laser, the main way that uh, radiofrequency energy works is by generating heat. The most recent version of this uh, device that's, that's available to us uh, has a catheter that's placed within the, the vein and passed to the saphenofemoral junction. And once it gets to the saphenofemoral junction, we use tumescent solution, perivenous uh, injection of tumescence. And that's the one uncomfortable part from the patient's standpoint, since all of our procedures are done under local anesthesia. But we collapse the vein around the catheter. We patient, place the patient in reverse Trendelen, or in, in Trendelenburg position. We start in reverse Trendelenburg to get it into the vein, but then when we're going to close it, we, put, we use the foot pedal and turn them into Trendelenburg. And this, this is what's, what's called termed segmental ablation. So, and there are actually now two catheters. This is a seven centimeter, but there's even a shorter catheter for short segments that need to be treated, although the majority are done with the seven centimeter. And the temperature is at 120 degrees, so it's above boiling, uh, extremely hot, and believe me, patients need to have the tumescence in order to not have pain. Occasionally, when you miss one small area and treat the patient, they quickly tell you that you need to put in more tumescence anesthetic. Now we use uh, strict adherence to what we call the IFU, and I'm, you may have the same term, instructions for use, and that includes that it be at least two centimeters from the saphenofemoral junction, and that the catheter, uh, that, it, that its placement is there. The IFU says that you should flush the catheter with saline, and some of us do that, some don't. Those who don't do it believe that fl putting saline in the catheter actually generates steam which goes out the end of the catheter and can extend the injury. But all of us use at least two, and now most people have used, have moved to three centimeters. We confirm this repeatedly during the procedure when we're setting it up to make sure we're at exactly the same, uh, at exactly the correct location. Uh, this is a, just some uh, intraoperative uh, uh, studies that are pictures that show uh, both the, the, sing the same person, the surgeon, using both the ultrasound and the, if you're right hand and the left hand and uh, the catheter in the right for a micropuncture technique followed by placement of a sheath and you see that uh, I think up here and this, and this is the, the sheath that's been put in and then we pass the catheter uh, up the vein and then uh, treat it and place it at the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, one of the issues that is hotly debated is the importance of this epigastric vein. It's nice when there's a, th when there's a, a measurement of at least three centimeters between this junction and the catheter and the epigastric vein is above it. Sometimes the epigastric vein is down here. Sometimes you have to pull the catheter back. But the point is that this can all be seen very nicely. Here's the tip of the catheter. And we find that with radiofrequency as opposed to laser that you can really see the catheter constantly during the procedure. So it's a rare event where it will be placed into the common femoral vein and you won't know it. But
but we always are, are confirming the position. Now once the catheter is placed in the vein and the thermal energy is applied, you take a normal looking vein, it's just a little clotum, but this is a normal wall of a vein, and this is what it looks like after the ablation, very similar to the laser pictures that you just saw. It's thermal energy that's damaged and caused scarring of the vessel. There's no residual lumen, and the key, as was mentioned with laser, is to make sure that this vein is collapsed around the catheter, so you're not just boiling or heating blood, which can cause the extension of a clot, but you actually put the catheter into the vessel, collapse it, so that all of the thermal energy is transmitted to the wall here and causes extensive scarring as well as spasm. Now the original paper by Bob Merchant and uh, Ralph De Palma and Lowell Kabnick was in 2002, and uh, there were several things that we learned from that. Number one, how effective it was, but unfortunately there was not perf perfection, and there were a few patients who recanalized, and that led to the changes in the development of that. And what they talked about was the importance of pushing the vein down far enough so you don't get a skin injury, to, not, to make sure that you put enough tumescence to not injure the saphenous nerve, and to make sure that you're at least 2 to 2.5 centimeters away from the saphenofemoral junction so the clot didn't extend into the deep venous system and you didn't get a deep vein thrombosis. They also reported about a 5% incidence of, of uh, a saphenous, what they called uh, recurrence, which we don't think actually was the case. Now we were influenced in, uh, by uh, Dr. Hing uh, Hingarani and Dr. Asher's group, which reported here a 16% incidence of venous thrombosis. And when we looked at that paper, that was our greatest concern when you compared all the different institutions. When you looked at that in detail, you found that the majority of them came from extension into the femoral vein from, the, from clot in the saphenous. And we thought that they were a little bit too hard on themselves, and actually these were not true DVTs, but in fact extension uh, from the saphenous into the deep system. So that led to us developing a classification system, uh, which I'll show you here. And if you look at level one through level six, it's below the epigastric vein for level one, level two is above it, but below the, uh, the saphenous flush with the saphenous vein. And each one of those, we assigned a suggested treatment. So level one is what you'd always want, or level two. When, when it gets flush with the, with the femoral vein, we thought that it was a judgment of the surgeon as to whether they wanted to treat the patient with a short course of Lovenox, whereas when you get to level six, which actually we never had a single case of that, but that would be deep vein thrombosis and require both heparin and Coumadin. So these are just pictures of level one showing you the closure level with the arrows. Level two, in which uh, it's closer to, but, but still uh, not into flush with the vein. Here's one when you can see it exactly flush with the vein on a transverse view. Here's one where you see it bulging into the vein, into the common femoral vein. Here's one where it's really extended. This becomes really worrisome, and we all thought if this were our brother or sister who was 25 years old and had clot from the saphenous vein extending into the deep vein, would we want to have it treated? And so we decided that we would. We never had a level six. If you see, there's a direct correlation between the size of the vein and whether or not you have one of the level three, four, or five. So the bigger the vein, and you can see that there are a lot of these, for level four and five, we had patients who had essentially huge saphenous veins, some of them up to two centimeters in our more recent experience. So when we looked at this and compared the two, what our feeling was was that when you got to the level three, four, and five, that any big vein greater than 10 millimeters, you had to be concerned about that because we had a 25% incidence of, of these three, four, and five. If you looked at just the four and fives, you found those a little bit lower. So we use as a break point about eight millimeters to one centimeter as the one we become concerned about extension into the deep venous system. And this is a report of our experience uh, with that, where we had 1,000 patients, essentially no DVT in our series using this more aggressive approach. Now, I'll just mention that there is another option, which is the mechanico-chemical ablation, which has recently come out in the United States. And this is a device which is placed into the saphenous vein, and then it rotates at a high speed and injures the vein wall. And here you can see the, the tip of the catheter as it, as it uh, rotates. And once it gets, here you can see it rotating, and once it rotates, then 
we inject sclero into that vein in order to clot the vein. Uh, we have had very little experience with this here, you can see the, but we have used it several times and believe it has potential, particularly for below knee saphenous veins where you're worried about saphenous nerve injury. There have been a lot of reports of this outside the United States, and I would just point out that the great saphenous vein has shown no nerve injury. So we believe that from the knee down, this may be a real potential in patients who have extensive lipodermatosclerosis and venous ulcers. Now I'll finish up by just telling you about what we do for the uh, for perforators, and just mention I showed you these pictures yesterday. The RFS catheter, which is again radio frequency passed into the perforator vein and used to ablate it. And you're going to hear about this technique later, but I just will point out this is not a simple thing to do for any of us. It's more difficult than you think, and our arterial endovascular surgeons have some challenges in doing these in the beginning. But you place it into the perforator and then ablate it, and this is just the process of ablation using the heat, and then mark it so that you can follow up and confirm closure. And just to show you how difficult this is, uh, the first one is my experience, a single surgeon, and I've gotten up to a little bit over 80% success, and this is for our whole group, which is slightly less than that. So this is, again, not an easy procedure. So in summary, uh, we think that endovenous ablation, and it doesn't require uh, the radio frequency, although that's what we've had experience with, a similar experience with the laser, that it, is, it results with saphenous vein in a 99% success rate. And you just have to watch out for the patients with very large veins and watch them carefully for the risk of deep vein thrombosis. And when it occurs, treating them with Lovenox for a period of one week, the vein, the clot will always retract back into the saphenous vein, and it rarely requires long-term Coumadin. Perforators are more challenging, but with some practice can be equally treated. Thanks for your attention.